Hey, welcome back to another episode of Parker's Pensies. I'm your host, Parker Sedicase, and this is a podcast where we explore all the deepest ideas in philosophy, theology, nature, and life. I love thinking about cool stuff, so come think with me. This episode's very, very special. I have with me Dr. Dre, Dr. Dre Rusevuk. Uh, it's a Ukrainian name, I learned the hard way by guessing Russian first. Don't do that. Uh, we're going to be talking about God as the luckiest possible being, which is wild. Like, all of my classical theist friends should be pulling out your hair right now. We're going to get into it. We're going to talk about who is God? What is God like? What does it mean to be lucky? What's the problem of moral luck? And how does it make God the luckiest being of all? Uh, Dre's awesome, man. He just finished up his PhD. So he's Dr. Dre. If you guys like this podcast, please consider supporting it on Patreon and YouTube members. I don't want to commodify myself too much, but I need the lights to stay on. I need to feed my dogs. So if you guys like when I bring scholars on to talk about their work, please consider supporting the podcast. That's probably enough for now. Let's bring in Dr. Dre. Dre, man, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you have a pretty long, distinguished list of awesome philosophers, and they're like, there's me. So I'm honored to be on here. Talk about That's my awesome. paper. Yeah, dude, you you raised the whole list by showing up, so I appreciate it. Um, Dude, how'd you get interested in <laughs> philosophy and theology in the first place? Um, yeah, okay. So let's see. I um, um, I guess I guess we can start like back in two thousand eight. I became a Christian. I got really interested in just reading and and doing like apologetics. And then I uh, went to grad school. I wanted to be a theologian. And then after sitting in on a few philosophy classes, shout out to uh, Dr. Welty, Jeremy Evans, Bruce Little. Um, nice. That just like rocked my world. And I thought, you know what? I think philosophy is more where I, I felt at, at home. So I switched, uh, switched to philosophy and that's how I got interested. Nice, man. And, and, uh, tell the folks where you just completed your PhD at. Uh, university of Birmingham with, uh, Eugene Nagasawa and L. L. Wilson, or my, uh, supervisor. Nice, man. Was your dissertation or maybe it's called a thesis over there because it's UK. Was it on uh, God and moral luck? Yeah, it was. It was perfect uh, being in theism and luck. Yeah. Nice, man. That's awesome. Um, well, okay. So you told us how you got into philosophy, but how'd you get into this topic of God and luck? Um, I, I think I would just say um, a few years ago, I was really interested in the luck objection to libertarianism. Uh, I At that time, I was a libertarian. I guess I'm still a more agnostic now. Um, and I just reading that literature and somehow I got into moral, like, I don't really remember or how or when, and I was just fascinated with this idea of moral luck and whether or not moral luck exists. And then just the thought came like, wait a minute, I wonder like if, uh, I'm perfect being theism, if God could be lucky. And then I tried to find some answers and I didn't find anything, almost nothing written on that. And so my, uh. My advisors were like, this would be a great topic. And that's kind of how I started writing on God and luck. Yeah, that's awesome, dude. Well, okay. So I'm, I took some definitions of God from the paper. Um, so the paper is the luckiest of all possible beings. And given divine perfections, God is the lucky of, luckiest of all possible beings. That's like the main argument. Um, God is maximally great. He's unsurpassable. He's a perfect being, a perfect being. Uh, equals DEF, a being is perfect if and only if that being is the sole possessor of the largest collection of compossible perfections, i.e. great making properties. That sounds like a mouthful to a lot of folks who are listening. It is a mouthful, but that's pretty standard, like perfect being theology, right? You're, you didn't make anything up. That's just, that's what people take perfect being theology to be. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I, I know that I'm leaving some excluding some people out and some different varieties of theism, but I was just interested in this conception of God as the like metaphysically greatest possible being and whether that being that's supposed to have like all these perfections, right? Supposed to be unsurpassable in greatness, whether that specific being could be subject to like. Yeah. And so, um, so, uh, those who hold to, uh, the divine perfections, uh, in, in classical theists, they, you give this characterization or you give this principle, the perfect immutability thesis. Uh, and that's just that necessarily God is uh, perfectly immune to luck. And I, I'm not really, I don't have like a position. I, I like to poke holes in everyone's position. 
So I'm like trying to think from a classical theist perspective. Do you know anyone who's a classical theist who would be like, oh, I don't buy that. I think God could be lucky. Who would be what? I'm sorry. You're cutting like God, God could be lucky. Or, or do you think that, um, is that just like standard classical theism, um, that perfect immutability thesis just follows right out of it? Um, well, in the paper, so I call it the perfect immunity thesis. So Im immutability, I'm not really thinking about like sorry, classical right. theism or anything. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. So okay. I come across a few different philosophers who do work on luck, who think that God would not be subject to luck. So Nicholas Rescher is one of them and uh, E.J. Kaufman. Um, they have very brief things to say about this. Um, but I think just from like personal conversations with theists across the board, a lot of them have the intuition that a perfect being would not be lucky. And they're talking to like non-philosophers. They're definitely like, no, there's no way that a perfect being could be subject to luck. That's like, that's like almost like that my blasphemous thought maybe to think that. Yeah. 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 I, I was trying to get in this headspace and cause I haven't. I haven't really thought about it. It kind of freaks me out when I get to this level. Um, I hadn't thought about it too much, but I thought mm, if you ask the kid, hey, is God lucky to be God? I think the kid might be like, yeah, man, like I'm not God. I didn't, I didn't happen to be God. But then I guess if you talk to him, you're like, well, dude, let me school you on some um, theism stuff. You could never have been God. It's not like you could have been uh, a rodent or a bird or God or yourself. So I, I, yeah, I don't know. I, I guess it depends on like origin essentialism or something like, is God lucky to be God just from that, from that perspective? Like he, he couldn't have not been God, I guess. So it's weird. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So usually when people think about, um, like that kind of luck that I'm concerned with in the paper, which is constitutive luck. Maybe I should, I should explain what, what I mean by that. This idea that um, there are factors beyond our control that make up who we are, human beings. Like some of us are born like highly intelligent. Some of us are born very athletic. Some of us are born with, I don't know, like great ability to grow a great mustache like that. Uh, my, my, my wife won't let me have, but you know, whatever. So like. But then we think like, okay, but what about like some of these properties that are like essential to us, right? Like maybe I couldn't have existed without being a generous person or a athletic person. So in what sense am I lucky? Because there's nobody, like I couldn't have been, I couldn't have been presumably born, I don't know, in a different time and place, right? If like origins essentialism is true. Mm -hmm. um, I could have not been a firstborn like to my, to my parents. Um, so some people just might say, no, that doesn't make sense. Um, and, but there's something incoherent about the idea of constitutive luck. It seems like constitutive luck requires you to like first exist and then see whether or not you're going to be uh, luckily endowed with like a generous disposition or like showing compassion or kindness or being a truthful person. But since you can't exist prior to possessing like your character, right? Um, Constitutive luck is incoherent, and this same sort of objection applies to God. God can't fail to be omnipotent and omniscient and perfectly loving and gracious. So in what sense can God be lucky? It just seems incoherent to think that God could be lucky if he couldn't fail to possess these essential properties. So that's uh, one of the objections that I consider in my paper to the coherence of constitutive luck. Yeah, I love that. I, I totally, uh, I have that on my outline and I, I stepped on my own outline because I forgot that I put that down there. That's awesome. Uh, just, I wanted to ask your own intuitions on that objection to constitutive luck and origin essentialism. Like, do you think that you could have been an alligator? Um, I mean, I guess if you're convinced by Plantica's uh, famous mm -hmm. article on this, right? Um, and like whether or not, I guess we have souls like God put them and sold me like in the animal body, um, I guess maybe. But as I say in the paper, whether or not origins, essentialism is true of human beings, it's 
like if we apply it at least broadly to God, it has to be true. Like God couldn't have been a slightly more powerful God, right? Or a slightly less omniscient God. It seems just like those perfections that usually theists attribute to God, God has them like in every possible world. Like that's just what it like means to be God, exemplifying all these uh, great making properties. Yeah, that's that's really good. So it's at least origin essentialism is at least true of God, if that even makes sense. Because like, did he have an origin? If he's like a necessarily sure. existent, yeah. you know, like, or even if even if yeah. not, I don't think they would say just he began. Um, yeah, I I also see a connection, and maybe I'm wrong here between this and the grounding objection to Molinism. Where it's like, what do you, what is this essence that's, uh, you, there's these counterfactuals of cre creaturely freedom and you would, God has this middle knowledge of what you would do in a, in a different possible world if he, uh, actuated that possible world. And, it, and I, I see a similar argument, uh, or at least a connection here saying like, well, what do you, the origin essentialist is saying of constitutive luck, like this doesn't make sense because I, I don't exist and then have all my properties. And likewise, someone raising the or uh, the grounding objection to Molinism is like, well, what are you talking about? What are these counterfactuals of creaturely freedom grounded in? It's like you have this essence of Parker before any of his properties, and then God's putting him in a different world and seeing what he'll do. What, what do you make? Do you see a connection there, or is that just uh, grasping at straws? Um, I mean, maybe, maybe. Uh, um, just going away from the counterfactual and the ground damage objection, I, I do think, to, just to point out, I think on Molinism, God is also subject to like, to a different kind of like called circumstantial, oh. like, um, it is because he has metal knowledge that, that kind of cites the question. I don't know. I, I need to think more about the connection between grounding these counterfactual yeah. and, um, constitutive like. Well, can you, can you flesh that out the, uh, the circumstantial look, um, because it's good to, to get the definition too. And, uh, if you have it on top of your mind, like how, how is, um, circumstantial luck play into the God of, of Molinism? Well, okay. So on Molinism, the God's knowledge of, uh, counterfactuals, right? The truth is counterfactuals of creaturely freedom of pre-volitional, mm -hmm. um, and depending on like the, the creaturely world type that is actualized, depending the take like set of all true counterfactuals, um, God's creative de decree, um, is going to be based on which worlds are available for him to actualize, right? Like this is like yeah. a standard bonus that just acknowledgement that some logically possible worlds are actually not feasible for God to actualize. Okay. And then, so like, and, um, and, and one of the, in the chapter in the dissertation and one of the papers that. Uh, I'm writing, I'm just thinking like, okay, in circumstantial luck, there are factors beyond your control that influence and make an impact on what you do, right? So on Molinism, depending on the truth value of all these counterfactuals, there are some things that God is not able to do. Um, and if he does do those things that maybe he, he wanted to or intended to do, it seems that he'd get lucky. So like if God can actualize a world in which has like a, let's say a optimal salvific balance of people that are going to end up, you know, in heaven and then, um, in hell or just damned, God gets lucky. So base and, and, and this luck, right. It's driven by something external to God and yeah. uh, the paper here with constitutive luck and considering something that's like internal to God with Molinism, this might be more problematic. There are factors beyond God's control that sort of, um, determine, I don't mean necessitate, but I mean like heavenly influence what God can do. The counterfactuals could have been such that God couldn't actualize a, like a good enough possible world. Mm -hmm. And the fact that God presumably did actualize a good enough possible world, it seems like that's partly a matter of luck. Yeah. Oh, that's nice dude. That's really fun. I wonder, again, this is maybe just a half baked thought here, but I wonder like, is there a possible world where every creature with mm, with freedom whatever they're taking freedom to be i think usually they slip in pap but some some say they don't uh i wonder if like every person there's a possible world where every person was uh trans world depraved you know it's like it, mm -hmm. it, it's like what why are maybe it's still back to the grounding objection but he actualizes this possible world this is the one where most people will choose god freely 
under their own volition. But why think that there's even that world? Like, he's lucky that there's a world where that's the case. Uh, why, why isn't everyone trans world depraved? That would be like an external factor to him. Hmm. Maybe yes, it's possible, something. But, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's something that God has no control over. And presumably, if everyone were trans world depraved, then God would have made uh, creatures that are free in the libertarian sense. Yeah. So yeah, even yeah. the, so even like God's actualizing world that has free creatures that are held, you know, morally um, blameworthy or praiseworthy for certain things is something that's beyond God's control. Uh, and that seems weird. It does, it does seem weird to think that the kind of world that God can actualize, it's just a matter of luck, or at least yeah. partly a matter of luck. Uh, Dre, this doesn't have a whole ton to do with what we're talking about, but did, did Welty get his hooks in you? Are you, are you, uh, are you compatibilist yourself? I am not. No, I, I would consider him. I think I'm more along with Mealy. I, okay. I came into like grad school thinking I'm definitely a libertarian. Then my confidence in libertarianism slowly waned, but I think there are like problems with, um, compatibilism. So I'm, I'm like Gnostic, like Mealy, I, I think somewhere along those lines. That's cool, man. That's funny. Um, it's tough stuff. And there's so, I love, I love all the problems. And then when you try to like, think about yourself and you're like, well, what do I believe? Like, wait, no, all these problems are here. Dang it. Why did I, why did I read these? Um, yeah, it's so good. Well, let's get, let's get back yep. to, um, to, to luck. And, uh, I want to talk about control because it looks like control and luck are like, uh, in an inverse relationship. Can you help us with control and luck? Yeah, so in most counts of luck, in most analyses of luck, um, the lack of control plays a big uh, part in that um, for numerous reasons. First of all, just in everyday language, it seems that that's how people talk, right? Like when you win the lottery and we're like, I got so lucky. Part of what people mean, right, or just that winning the lottery is something outside of their control. So um, in the count that I given the paper and defending my dissertation, um, I think, I think that lack in control is a necessary, but not a sufficient condition for luck. And there are a host of, you know, objections to thinking that lack, lack of control is like the only thing that matters. I mean, think about like the sun's rising, right? Is the common objection, like the sun rose today. That seems like, I don't want to say that's a matter of luck for me. Like that wouldn't be like maybe the right word to use for that. And so people come up with like different, um, uh, different, um, requirements for something to be a matter of luck. But I think, um, in the paper, I do think control has to be, or lacking control has to be a, uh, requirement for God to be lucky. Okay. Yeah. You, you, uh, flesh it out in direct control and indirect control. And I, I was even thinking the, the sun one's good, but I was thinking about like epistemological luck where if you're not a doxastic voluntarist that is like if you if you are not uh, for the folks at home if you're not able to choose what you believe like directly which seems like a good thing probably we we want to be like guided by reasons and stuff uh then it seems like all your beliefs would be outside of your control and then you're like lucky to have the beliefs that you have but maybe indirect control yeah. can help us out here yeah so um after Thomas Nagel and uh, Williamson published their papers on more moral luck. This was like end of the 1970s. Um, the little debates about the nature of luck really took off. And a lot of um, philosophers started chiming in and trying to figure out like, what's a good analysis of luck? And the person that did perhaps the most to get uh, the wheels turning was Duncan Pritchard. Um, and, in his book, I forget what the name of it is. And he's the one that really talked about epistemic luck and how luck is incompatible really with, with knowledge. And he tried to give an account of epistemic luck. And then from there, um, a lot more other philosophers chimed in and started thinking about, okay, yeah, epistemic luck seems to be a problem in epistemology. Like where else might subjection to luck be? And then that went to like better, uh, ethics. And, um, politics, like luck egalitarianism, um, and maybe some parts of metaphysics, like the free will debate, right? Like something is partly a matter of luck is that like, do we, how do you hold you responsible to that? Do you exercise enough control over your action? If there are even a partly a matter of luck, 
Um, and now I hope to bring sort of maybe worries about luck, or just a good analysis of luck into philosophy of religion. Yeah, man. That's so good. I, I love it. Uh, once it, once it hits philosophy of religion, it's so much fun for me. I used to be kind of like, uh, bashful about telling people I study philosophy of religion. <clears throat> and then I realized like philosophy of religion is philosophy on hard mode because I also have like strong commitments in this area and it touches on so many different subfields of philosophy. So once it gets there, it just like yeah. spreads out to your whole worldview. It's pretty. Yes. It, yes. Yes. It's, it's very interconnected and that's why it's hard. At least for me, like you were asking me about the free will debate. It's like, I wish I had a, like, I guess like a clear, good defense of this position, but I don't because I'm always thinking about like, well, this is intentional with this part and I haven't like figured that out yet. And I haven't figured that part out and it's all interconnected. And, but I think that's, I mean, that's, that, that's good for philosophers. There's always work to be done. Oh, that's right, man. That's so good. Um, okay. There, there's also, um, okay. Well, maximum you make this point that maximum control rules out luck because those are in inverse relationships so if you have maximum control then there's not going to be any luck but then uh, maximum luck would rule out praiseworthiness because if you're if you're lucky you're not praiseworthy I, this one is um i i like agree with it but i could imagine people being like uh eh, maybe you can be praised for your constitution even if your constitution is the product of luck like maybe if someone if someone's handsome they're lucky to be handsome if, unless they had plastic surgery unless they like you know chewed one of those new rubber ball things that makes your jaw thick um so like if you're handsome it seems like that's a result of luck and yet i could still praise you for being handsome right yes i think so i don't think i actually don't think the luck in like our constitution or luck in general is incompatible with praiseworthiness. Okay. Um, because there are so many things about like just human beings that are a matter of luck. Mm. Um, I think it, I think it's like, it makes sense to praise somebody like for, for being like a great basketball player or being naturally gifted or athletic or thing that makes sense. I think the problem comes in is when we think about God being a, a unsurpassable being. So the way that maybe praiseworthiness affects god and how much praiseworthiness he deserves mm -hmm. um i think maybe that's where the tension comes in but like just to be clear i don't in, in my paper i don't set out to show that subjection to constitutive luck really is problematic right um yeah i just want to show that people who think that god is perfectly immune to luck there are good reasons and arguments to think that now even a perfect being is subject to some kinds of luck yeah it seems like just still in at the intuitive level i'm like it just sounds so weird to think that god could get lucky um yeah. so i like i'd be happy to be proven wrong and like okay great a perfect being is not subject to any luck uh whatsoever like i would yeah. welcome the conclusion that it's not like it's, it's not a hell i'd be willing to die on um but you talked about praiseworthiness yeah i think mm -hmm. so like Okay, perfect being a theist, think that God has like the greatest set of all perfections, right? And certainly we think that like control, uh, exerting control over like different, different wide range of things is a perfection. Like in philosophy, control is required for you to be free and morally responsible, blameworthy, praiseworthy, control, like being able to exert control is part of maybe what it means to be an agent. So it seems that like control is a great make property, right? Okay. Um, if that's the case, then if God has the greatest set of compatible great make properties, it seems that God would have like this property of control. And then we work with the assumption that the greatest possible being would have each of its perfections, like to the maximum extent, right? So we don't want to like a perfect being that's very powerful but not like omnipotent. No, we want like mm -hmm. an omnipotent being, right? As powerful as it's like metaphysically possible. Uh, yeah, we don't want to like, be uh, that with, has with, with like the com possibility, right? Like where like, cause, um, I think, uh, Nagasawa talks about that in his book where it's like, they have to also be compatible with the other ones. Right. So maybe you like turn down the omnipotence in order to make it make sense with whatever other doctrine, right? Is, isn't that the compossibility yeah. doctrine or thesis or whatever? 
for, I'm sorry, the first part you cut out, you're talking about Eugene's work, Maximal God? Yeah, I think he goes in, like he, he plays the compossibility pretty hard where it's like, um, all these attributes that we take God to have, they have to like be dialed in right to all fit together nicely. Yeah, that's that, that that's one view that you could have. Like you think that like maybe, I don't know, uh, like omniscience is like incompatible with, you know, like human freedom or something like that. And you, or, or the way that you would say that, well, no, like omnipotence doesn't mean that God can do the logically impossible, right? So we got to sort of maybe tame that down. I don't think that, I don't think, um, I'm not sure if the same thing would apply to like control. I, I guess people could say like, somebody might think that, well, if God has like maximum control, then like just humans can't be free. Right. So God has to sort of let us do our thing. And so we have to like dial down, decrease the level of control that God, that God exerts. Um, maybe that's the case. Um, I'm sure people, I'm sure people, all perfections. But it is, I think, a pretty standard uh, view in perfect being theology, perfect being theism, that all of perf God's perfection, they're held to like the greatest possible extent. Yeah. 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 Greatest possible versus greatest compossible would be the one to, to hit on for folks. Uh, that's an interesting distinction. Maybe I can explain like maybe one worry with this idea that God could be lucky to be like lucky who he is or who he is. Um, so. If God is cons like constitutively lucky, um, then, I mean, we don't want to say that God has control over his nature, right? Like most perfect being, being theists will deny that yeah. unless you go like the theistic, like activism route. Yeah. Um, Tom Morris. We want to say that. Earth. Yeah. 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 So we want to say that like God's perfections are non-voluntarily possessed, right? Like he didn't like choose to have, them. um, and it's like, well, does it make sense to say that God is therefore lucky? Like if they're necessarily part of his essence or, or nature, um, in what sense does it make sense to say that they're lucky? And, uh, like one move that I make in the paper is, and this is not an idea original to me, this is just a distinction in the philosophy of luck literature. It's making the distinction between a uh, direct constitutive luck and indirect constitutive luck. Direct constitutive luck is just that, like, suppose you pos you possess some sort of property, like you're right, like genius or high intelligence or whatever it is. It's not voluntarily acquired, like you were you were just born with it, right? Um, and we say that person is very lucky to be very smart, or that person is very lucky to be athletic or beautiful or generous. That's direct constitutive luck. And I say in the paper, like, even if this kind of constitutive luck is incoherent, we can think about constitutive luck in terms of indirect constitutive luck. This is just when that good property or trait, when it affects what you do. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly, like divine perfections, even if it's incoherent to say that God is lucky to be perfect, say, perhaps it still makes sense to say that God is lucky, indirectly lucky to be perfect because like his perfections, in some cases, like severely um, delimit what he does. Um, and like on this account of constitutive luck, I think it does make sense to say that God is lucky. Um, so like in various situations, God acts out of his character, right? Um, he can't do otherwise, maybe in some situations, right? But in other situations, like, um, I think God could choose A or B, like his character, his uh, perfections don't necessitate that you do like one specific thing. So if at least in, in like, in some cases, God has leeway, God can choose A or B, but whether let's say God chooses A is like significantly or partially influenced by his nature, then it's partly a matter of constituent of luck that God, God does A instead of doing B. You brought up this, uh, in, in one of the footnotes, you mentioned that, uh, I think maybe one of the readers, uh, suggested that strong versions of divine impassibility would want, uh, to rule out, um, certain, certain types of luck from God. And I wonder if this indirect, con uh, constitutive luck is successful in, you know, getting around the strong 
divine uh, impassibility doctrine because this doesn't have anything to do with his maybe it does if it does it have to, anything to do with his external mm, environment or anything like god he's basing he's making his choice based on his own nature but i wonder yeah i wonder about if if someone's just like no nah, dude impassibility is so strong and it, it helps us pass this yeah well one reviewer points it out that on like strong uh, doctrines of immutability or maybe impassibility rather that okay maybe we should back up so in my account of luck there are like three conditions that have to be met for a state of affairs to be lucky for god right so one of them we already talked about this is the lack of control condition like this state of affairs is something that god um failed to exercise both direct and indirect control um the other condition though is called the significance condition this is the idea that in order for something to be lucky i just forgot but you and i right like that state of affairs or that event has to be like in some way significant for us it has to be we have to have like some sort of interest right so like winning the lottery that's significant for me so that would be a matter of luck and it's beyond my control so it would be a matter of luck so for god when we think about okay is god lucky to be perfect um one of the reviewer points out that my significant condition is violated because on strong versions of impassibility strictly speaking god just doesn't care about anything yeah. like maybe god has no interest and so since god has no interest whether state or affairs a or b pains um whichever way it goes it just won't be luck for god and <laughs> I don't know if you're gonna like my response in the funnel. I just, I just, I just write like, okay, if you think that God doesn't care about some like states of affairs, I think I'd give the example of like, you know, I don't know, billion people worshiping him versus, I don't know, say like only 10 people worshiping him. To me, it's pretty clear that God prefers one of the state of affairs over the other. But if you think that like doesn't move God, um, God doesn't care then, I mean, I, I'm just not going to change your mind. And I mean, this argument is just not going to work for you. Like, I, like I say that in a paper, like, yeah, if, if you, if you, if that's what you believe, um, you're not going to be happy with this argument. You're just going to think it, it, it's garbage and God can't get lucky. And that's because God doesn't care about me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, even still, so I, I saw that footnote and I saw your response. And I love that. But I, even still, um, isn't he... I wonder if he's lucky that he doesn't care because it's not, it's, if you don't think that his nature is up to him and he has this strong impassibility, then that was beyond his control, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, good. So maybe like the idea here is that like maybe God is just unlucky that he doesn't care about all these states of affairs that obtain. Okay. Is that what you're getting at? Well, I, like maybe God is. You could say unlucky, but you could also say like, hey, look, I, I got around this luck objection because your cons your significance condition was undermined by a strong sense of divine impassibility. But then why why does he have this strong sense of impassibility? Why is God like that? Why is he that kind of being and not a being that does care like other theologians take him to be? Well, did he choose that or was that just part of his nature? You know, and I don't know, maybe it's like a revenge case. Sure, yeah. Then they would have to say, well, it's part of God, like uh, nature, essentially, like he just doesn't care. And then we can say, okay, so then this attribute, yeah, I don't know if you can call that, like this property of like not caring, um, it significantly imp influences what God maybe does, then it would still be subject to indirect constitutive of like, yeah. be because it's, it's not voluntarily acquired. Right. Yeah. Yeah, dude. So I think you have, I think you have even more to say than just, uh, I'm not going to convince people. Like, I think there's a revenge case. That's sweet. Fun, dude. But you should write, you should write a paper. You should write a paper. Yeah, like, yeah, um, yeah. Funny. Um, no, it's maybe, just, maybe hopefully like somebody will respond to it, you know, like, totally. uh, like, uh, I don't know, like a classical theist and then all on you, man, you make it happen. Like, no, right. this is a bad response because no, yeah. I'm just him right back to you. You go take it up with Dr. Dre. That's funny. Um, okay. So 
Uh, praiseworthiness, constitute of luck. Okay, so why would God be the luckiest of all possible beings? Okay, so we think about like it seems like, and in, in a pa- in a paper, I like I give some reasons to think that like the the more valuable um, something is in your constitution, um, the luckier you are with respect to it. I mean, that's like pretty, pretty, pretty plausible. Like if you have a IQ of, let's say 130, uh, yeah, you're lucky to be like that. It's like smart to that degree. But if you have a IQ of like 180, it seems like you're even more lucky, right? Cause like, um, that's even like a better, a better, uh, higher IQ is better to possess like all things being equal. Right. Um, okay. So then we think about God's perfection. Just think about what it means to be like omnipotent, omniscient perfectly uh, free, immaterial, like perfectly loving God, right? Um, it seems like that's like the greatest sort of property that anybody could have. Um, and it turns out that there's only one person that can possess that property. I'm perfect being theism, right? There's only like one possessor of the greatest array, a spectrum of gray making properties. Okay. So if like we can combine all of God's perfections into like the attribute or the property. And we just call it like per- perfect. Like God is the sole possessor of this property called perfect. And that's just the c- combination of all great making properties. Well, if he's the only possessor of it and it's such a great property, I mean, it, it's think too hard to imagine a property that you can be more lucky with respect to. Um, and so if God is the only possessor of this property, perfect, then he it seems like and again, I'm reluctant to say this because it sounds uh, semi-blasphemous maybe, yeah. but it seems that God is like the luckiest of all possible beings. Like it, it's harder to imagine a being that is more lucky than God and possessing the property of perfect. Yeah, uh, that's, uh, that's really succinct and good. Um, I'm wondering about uh, necessity and luck. I, it, I haven't thought a ton about luck, so you know, forgive me if this is really uh, naive. But I'm thinking that luck has to do with um, things possibly going the other way. Like if it was yes. absolutely determined that I win the lottery and I found that out after I won the lottery, I think most people would be like, that's not really lucky. If I went around saying, oh, luckily I won the lottery. And they're like, no, dude, we saw the tape. Like it was destined and, and God told us that it was predestined that you would win the lottery. Uh, I think that would like... To me, that would rule out yeah. luck. Um, do, maybe you don't have the same intuition. Do you, do you think that's true? It would. I think it would rule out specifically um, maybe constitutive luck. So, okay, so let's go back a little bit. One of the primary objections against um, the coherence of constitutive luck is just what you're saying here. If I couldn't have existed with a different constitution, like in what sense does it make sense to say I'm lucky to be X? But just like, that's just part of who I am, right? Like in every, maybe like in every possible world, like I'm essentially like human, for example, right? Um, so it's not lucky that even though that's beyond my control as significant for me, like I'm not a gnat or, or, or a squirrel or something, right? like I'm a, I'm a human, that, that's awesome. So yeah. that's a pretty popular con- um, objection to consider luck. It seems that it violate a third condition and a lot of accounts of luck. And this is the modal condition. So the modal condition says that in order for something for you to be lucky, it has to be that like in an impossible world, that thing, things go other way. So why am I lucky to win the lottery? Not only because it's beyond my control, but because in the nearby possible world, I actually lose just like one number, right? The ball rotates slightly to the right and it's a different number. And I lose. why am I lucky to survive the car accident? Well, because in another possible world, right, the, I, 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 uh, the semi-truck like hits me head on and I, and I die. So I escaped by luck. It was beyond my control and because things could have gone differently. So now when we think about like constitution of humans and God, it's like, well, if they could, like if things could not have gone other way, God is essentially perfect. Then it makes no sense to say that God is lucky. Okay. In my paper. I, I offer a response to this objection and it basically says, okay, we need to drop the modal condition and we need to replace it with a different condition that's called the 
what do I call it in the paper? I forgot what my own stuff that I wrote. It's called the uncommon, uncommon property condition. Oh, that's Something right. Like that. Yeah, yeah. Uncommon property. Un uncommon condition. property move. And yeah, this is the yeah. idea. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah this is the idea that like, forget about thinking that you could have been constituted differently. All we need to do to establish that you're lucky, let's say to be a genius, is to compare you to all other people. So we can say like Parker's a genius because in the class of all existing human beings, an IQ of 160 is very rare. Okay, that makes sense. So I'm not comparing Parker to a Parker or a different possible world, with a different IQ. I'm just comparing you to the people that exist in our world. So being born a genius is beyond your control. That's significant for you. And it's a uncommon property because there are not a lot of people that have an IQ of 160. So that's what makes you lucky. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Really lucky. I, I I love this. And I, I forgot to mention that I wrote, I wrote down that move as well. I, I really like that uncommon, uncommon property. And I, I also, I don't like, maybe I just don't understand. I'm sure I probably don't understand, but I don't like modal accounts because it seems like it's like an empirical test, even though it's supposed to do with like modalities. And you're like, well, let's look in all the other possible worlds. Like, are you lucky? Well, let's see what happened in all. And you, I think you can use uh, um, conceivability as a test for modal yeah, uh, yeah. necessity and stuff. That's fine. But it's so weird. Am I lucky? Well, did I win in all these other possible worlds or not? Well, um, that's not really explanatory to me. Just going and saying, did I or not? Why did I? Like, what? why did I have to? Okay. Well, because look at all the other accounts that are, look at all the near possible worlds you did. But why? Why in that possible world? Well, because in the next one, and it's like, what, yeah. how is this an explanation? So I, I actually like that <laughs> move to, to go from the modal to, uh, to the uncommon property. I wonder, uh, I wonder if the case changes when you're an, a necessary being, because, um, you know, you're looking at, you're looking at me amongst other, uh, things, but you know, some, I don't know, maybe a classical theist says God's not a thing, right? He's being himself. And so you can't really compare him to, yeah. you know, they're, they're going to play that move, right? They're going to. Yes. What, what do you think about that? Hey, again, um, I think that's in a footnote somewhere in classical okay. theists are going to like hate me for this thing. This is just garbage. But I say, look, like, like if you think God is really not a member, like of any set whatsoever, whatsoever, like there's nothing I can do to, to say, to convince you otherwise in a little footnote. So again, people that think that God cannot be placed. He's not a member, even of, like existing things, because he's like being. I forgot the phrase. It's like God is uniquely unique, or something like that. I don't know. I'm not really he's sure like what that means. Being um, God, being or something, yeah. Yeah, like if he's like beyond all characterization of, and he just can't be compared to any other, um, any other being like whatsoever. Um, then you're not gonna like this move in the paper, and you're just gonna think it's it's a bad move. I like the move, uh, to me, it does make sense to think that like, it's, like that God is the greatest possible being and like, well, why being, well, when we compare him to all other beings, right. He's like the best one, the only like perfect one. Okay. So how does the uncommon property condition apply to God? Right. Somebody says, okay, um, Dre, look, you're, you're comparing like God has, God is essentially perfect. There is no possible world in which he is not perfect. So it makes no sense to say that he's lucky. Um, okay. And the move here is like, okay, let's compare God, not to God himself in a different possible world, because they're going to be like, uh, essentially identical, right? God's nature doesn't vary. Um, let's compare, let's see whether or not this property that God had perfect perfection, maybe let's see if this property is rare or unique when we compare God to all kinds of other beings. Now, somebody might say, so the, there's an objection to this line of thinking based on the, it's called the reference class problem, right? Like if we, we can compare, we like in one, in, in one class, you would be like l lucky with respect to P, but if we put you in a different class, you won't be lucky with respect to P. And it's like, how do we find the right class to put you in? And maybe for humans, that's hard to do. Like, okay. We say, okay, Parker has an IQ of 160. Let's compare him to other humans. We want to ask, okay, are these actual humans or are these possible humans? 
Because if it's possible with humor, there's an infinite amount, right? If you have a IQ of 160 and we compare you only to humans that exist, it seems that you're lucky to be a genius, right? But if we compare you, we extend this class or we put you in a class of all possible humans, then you're no longer lucky because there's an infinite amount of humans that are smarter than you, right? Somebody that has like you of 151, 162, 163. So you're not lucky. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like, why do we privilege one class over the other? It seems arbitrary, right? So this is the reference class problem. Okay. The move that I make in the paper is to say, I think I can give two um, non-arbitrary reasons why we place God in a certain class. First of all, because God is a being, now again, somebody is going to be unhappy with this club, but because God is a being, it seems pretty reasonable to compare him to other beings without specifying these are human beings, I don't know, sentient beings, angelic beings, just the class of all beings. And then what do we, what, what do we want to know about these beings? Since we're wondering whether the, the property perfect is rare in the class, we should compare God to beings that have at least one perfect. Maybe they have 10 perfections, maybe they have a thousand perfections. So let's, comp let's put God in the class of all beings. And furthermore, the second um, criteria on here is that these beings should have at least one perfection. That seems like two non-arbitrary reasons to put God in that class. And if this move works, then we ask, okay, in this specific class, is God lucky to be perfect? And we examine this class and lo and behold, there is only one being, one being only the greatest collection of all um, compatible perfections. And that's God. That's a unique property that only is held by one being in this class, God. And according to this analysis of luck, God is, uh, God is lucky to be perfect. I, I love that move. I think that's really uh, ingenuitive. I wonder if there's any other members in that class of uh, having any perfections. Like, I, I wonder what else would be. Right. So it's like you look in this class of, of if you have at least one perfection, you get in line. And then we look and we say, yeah. oh, God's got all the perfections, So he's lucky. But who else is in that line? Like who else has what other kind of things have at least one perfection? I can imagine saying uh, someone's saying, Not, nothing in creation. Yeah. Well, what do I have? I got a perfection. A mustache, an awesome mustache. No, well, but seriously, perfect. I mean, like, I don't, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Um, you have, I don't know. I, I'm just thinking of, um, perfection has great making property. Whatever yeah. even has one great making property. It doesn't have to be the maximum exemplification of that perfection. So you have the perfection or the great making property of being rational. Okay. Doesn't rationality make one better off? Yeah. So it's a or great being making... able to obtain knowledge. So we look at things with great making properties and that's the list and who's got the most great making properties. Okay. I was getting hung up on the perfections yeah. thing. Cause it's like, yeah, maybe nothing in, in creation is perfect. I should have specified by perfection. I just mean great making property. No, so if I, I, humans have at least one great making property, right? Like yeah. being like conscious, it's certainly better to be conscious than non-conscious or like a rock, right? That yeah. seems to be pretty, pretty plausible. Yeah. 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 No, that's good, man. Um, that's tough. Do you see any, okay. So I want people to take this up and I think some people in my audience will, cause this is fun. Uh, and I, I love that it's. It's spilling over. I guess it's not spilling. You're, you're directly injecting this luck into the, the literature on theism. Uh, what, what do you, where do you think that some work, the most immediate work is going to be done or, or could be done in following up? Like, where, where would you point people to, to continue working on this? Um, you, you mean like in my own work that I'm, that I'm doing no, just or like, existing so what, work? What, what's, what's next? Like, so if someone wants to respond to you, they'd probably want to pick on, um, I don't know, like your, your take on, uh, on perfections, of, uh, great making properties or, or something like that. Like a classical theist, we already kind of addressed the moves that they, like the hardcore ones I yeah. want to make, but, um, well, what do you think the next step in the literature? Cause it seems like it's kind of just opening up right now with, with some of your work, which yeah. is fun. 
I think uh, I think maybe a plausible response is just to say that acknowledge that necessarily God is subject to luck and, and just somehow explain that that's like from the fact that God is necessarily subject to some amounts of luck doesn't entail diminished greatness. Yeah. Um, so like, this is the idea of like, like your people in your audience probably be familiar with like William Rose argument, like no best uh, world, right? But like for every world that God can actualize, there's like one can he, that he could improve on, he can actualize a better, and he can actualize a better one and then a better one. And like any world that we can like, even like think of God can could have created a better world. But then it seems that God is surpassable because he could have, he didn't do like as good of a job as he could. Have. Mm -hmm. So there exists this other possible being that creates an even better world. So William Rowe concludes that God is surpass surpassable. He's not the greatest possible being. So, um, so maybe the move here would be like, no, Rowe is wrong. There could be like these like necessary, maybe limitations on God, but that, that doesn't diminish from his greatness. Uh, I can see somebody making that move. Yeah. But yeah. they would have to reject the perfect immunity thesis that just states that necessarily God is not subject to any luck of any kind. I actually think some theists are just straight up going to reject the thesis, like open theists I'm thinking of. I, oh, I yeah. think they're just going to say, yeah, it's, it's, it's not a problem that God is subject to some kind of luck. Yeah. Um, I, I wonder, I wonder if like, I wonder if the atheist community uh, uh, the atheist community and philosophy of religion might take it up and say like, Hey, look, perfect immunity thesis. This is a, uh, necessary attribute of God. If God exists, then he's immune to luck, but God can't be immune to luck. Therefore God doesn't exist. Yep. Yep. So this That's is something wild. that I brief, briefly consider, um, in my dissertation. And it's like, if, yeah, God is necessarily like the theist admits that necessarily God is just subject to luck because I mean, we only talked about two sort of avenues to sh like that I'm trying to show that God gets lucky. So like there's constitutive luck and we talked about circumstantial luck. There's also resultant luck. So this is luck in one's consequences. This is more for like open theists, maybe people that hold to like simple foreknowledge. God gets lucky depending on the consequences that uh, free creatures bring about. There's also present luck. So I have a paper right now under review. Um, I got to revise and resubmit and I resubmitted it. So fingers, fingers crossed. Yeah. Hopefully you get uh, lucky. I just argued that. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, I just argued that on any view on which God has libertarian freedom, I apply, I basically applied the luck objection to creaturely freedom to divine freedom. So on any view of which God has, liber uh, God's action satisfy libertarian conditions on free will, some of, some of his actions are going to be partly a matter of luck. So that's present luck. Um, then there's also like moral luck. Um, in my, in my, um, in my thesis, I consider different ways that God is subject to moral luck, which does seem to be problematic for me. So, I mean, hopefully, hopefully some of these, uh, paper papers will come out and I, I, I hope people will respond. I, I think that's, I hope the arguments are interesting enough for people either they like want to like crush me and say, no, this is just incoherent. This is bad. I'm all down for that. Like, let's get to the truth. Um, or maybe, maybe people will just improve on my arguments and say, no, like this is actually a serious problem. That's, that's, that's worth considering. Yeah. Yeah, man. That's yeah. fun. I, I, I'm, I'm, in, I'm excited for it. Uh, I am a little bit nervous and I can see why you're nervous as well. Like, but it's, it's, it's fun. It has to deal with truth. It has to deal with God's nature. And I think it's important stuff. So that's why I wanted to have you on to talk about it. Um, dude, so if, if someone wants to read some more of your work, where can they go to find that? Um, I mean, I don't have too many, this is the first paper that was published on, on, on this topic. Um, like I said, I have one more under, uh, review and then two more that I'm almost done. I will send out. Um, I just, I just delivered a paper on a uh, result of luck at a, at a little workshop and I got a lot of good objections and stuff that I need to improve on. I see some holes in my, um, argumentation. So hopefully those can out, but people can always email me. Um, and like, I, I can send them either drafts or something. Like awesome. That. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure people will want to see, uh, at least this paper for sure. So that's awesome, man. Well, thanks so much for your time and for the paper and for schooling me on luck, dude. I, it was tough slogging for me cause I'm not, 
super uh, into the literature, but it was really fun. Um, yeah. And yeah. I, I know, like, thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me. But luck is really like, a really, 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 it's like moral. Like, it's really interesting to think about. And I don't see a lot of like, I don't know, maybe like Christians interacting with this because there are a lot of like theological implications, right? Like it seems that, like, for example, like if we're subject to all this luck, then maybe it seems that like, I don't know, our sanctification is partly a matter of luck, like how does that work? And like, so I, I, I encourage people to, so, um, Robert Hartman and Ian Church, they just edited, this was like in 2019, a big strike book It's called the philosophy and psychology of luck. It's great. It talks about like mm. the history of luck or like ancient philosophers and how luck is applied to different d domains of philosophy, including theology. It's really fun. So that, that would be a good like starting point for people to get more into the luck literature. That's awesome, dude. I'm, I'm, I'm going to grab that book. My wife's probably not going to be happy you, you brought that up, but that's okay. Um, mm. All right, folks, that's going to have to do it for us for now. This has been Parker's Pensies and as always, all glory to God.